This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Are you as fascinated by dead malls as I am? Dude, you sent me down the rabbit hole. (laughs) (laughs) Well, our dying malls are certainly shaping the way we think about shopping, retail, and the future of public spaces as well. One of my guilty pleasures is hopping on YouTube, and Ryan has fallen down the rabbit hole. Dude. I don't there's something almost meditative about it. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to talk today about shopping and shopping malls. Later we'll talk about a history of, of shopping malls as well and, and these spaces. Also where we're going going forward. Yeah, I really like just looking at some of these decaying malls, the dead malls, the dying malls. Mm. There all three of those things are a little bit different. I think we'll be able to talk about the difference between Actually, let's just start there. So sure. so you, you, there are these terms out there you hear so this is a perfect topic for us, Ryan, because mm. This is a, a topic where we have a lot of expertise, especially me, because I opened a lot of retail stores, but right. you opened a few as well sure. in, in, in the corporate days. And so uh, for those of you who are yeah, I manage stores in indoor malls, open air, outdoor malls. Yeah. yeah kiosks like, yeah. and everything. Oh yeah. my goodness. And, and so um, at, the, at the peak of my corporate career around age 27, I was a director of operations for 150 retail stores. Now, most of those were what we call distributors. Some people might refer to them as franchises. Yeah. Uh, about 20% of them, 15, 20% were corporate owned stores, what we would call owned retail stores. Now, these were telecom stores. So what you would think of like with, with wireless phones, but also home phone, internet, home security systems, et cetera, uh, just, just technology companies and, and yeah. in, in the, the telecom realm. And, and so, I started in 1999 in telecom, mm-hmm. sort of worked my way up the corporate ladder. Yeah. And by age 24, I, well, I was store, store manager in my early 20s. Age 24, I was a, a regional manager, what we call an area manager, managing 10 to 16 stores. And I remember that all of my peers were sort of in their 40s or 50s. I'm still not in my 40s. I have another year of my 30s left, <laughs> less than a year now. But I I learned a lot through those those peers of mine who were a lot older, who had a lot more experience from me. And so I got to sort of extract the, a lot of the wisdom out of them. Also, our mentor, our friend Carl Widener, yeah. who, who's been on the quarantine conversations we did on Patreon, mm-hmm. had a really good conversation with him about retail. Who also uh, specializes in malls, uh, specifically leasing. Yes. <laughs> Different mall spaces. Right. And, yeah. and, and so... I, I've, I've been in that world for a long time. I'm no longer in that world, I, but I still stay abreast of it occasionally because I find certain aspects of it fascinating, but also I find these dead malls and these dying malls and these decaying malls fascinating. Let's talk about those three different terms there okay. because I think we often use them interchangeably, but they're, they're three different things. So a dead mall is... Uh... So let's start with a dying mall. Okay. Because uh, that's where it really starts. A dying mall is town and country. <laughs> Or Tri County, uh, Tri County now, yes. Yeah. Had, had you, can you believe? Tri- so we're talking uh, Cincinnati and Dayton, by the way. Yeah. Uh, That's what I loved about the videos that you highlighted uh-huh. in the notes was this, sp- specifically the Cincinnati uh, review of all the malls because I I feel like we grew up uh, like per capita we had more malls than any other state. Now I don't have the data to like back that up, but that's mm-hmm. what it certainly felt like. Yeah. In fact, we'll put a link to in in the show notes. We're going to talk about it during the Maximal episode. Uh, there's a series called Over Mauled Cincinnati. So there are three mm. different places I turn to to look for these dying mall videos. Uh, the first place is, actually, we're going to have Kristen on today from Unicom Productions. She couldn't make it in because of some travel restrictions. She had to quarantine for a period of time so she could mm-hmm. go to a wedding, so she mm-hmm. wasn't able to come out here for that. And and so we're still going to have this conversation because you and I have the expertise around it. We didn't have to have an expert on here. In fact, she's more of an amateur, but she's a filmmaker. So she's, she's diving into these, these malls. So we'll put a link to her channel. And then there are sort of two of the OGs from this space. There's Mm -hmm. a company called bright sun films or, or a guy, I think his name is Jake who runs a company called bright sun films. And he does sort of history of individual malls, but not just malls there. It could be like when Kmart goes out of business or when target went out of business in Canada. Yeah. And, and, 
he talks about the sort of history behind these things. And then there's the the original OG, the OOG, uh, Dan Bell. Um, um, he is a filmmaker who has been documenting dying malls for a long time and dead malls and decaying malls. So mm. let's get back to these terms. A dying mall is is a mall that is still open. Technically, you can still walk through it. Yeah. But a it's like ten percent occupancy, or it could even be fifty percent occupancy. Yeah. So, so, what, so Middletown Mall. That's another. Or did they finally close it? No. Down? I, if you haven't seen the mall, the the video on Middletown Mall yet, no, no, no. it's terrifying. You got to watch it after oh, we will after okay. this, we do this okay. episode. So let's cover dying mall. Middletown is not considered a dying mall. It probably is, and here's why. Okay. So a dying mall is a mall that is still open mm-hmm. and has fewer than 50% occupancy. Okay. Now, now here, here's, here's, here are the dominoes, though. Most malls have three or four anchor stores, right? right? Now, if one of them goes out of business, they have to scramble to try and fill that because if they don't, what happens is it often causes this cascading effect through the entire mall. It, right. It is the, the first domino that falls because, as you'll recall, remember when you, you managed the Fairfield Commons store mm-hmm. in um, Beaver Creek, Ohio? Yes. It's right next to a Sears, right? Right. Well, when that Sears went out of business, all of a sudden that entire wing of the mall dies and if that wing of the mall dies then all of a sudden you're like oh this is starting to become a dying mall isn't that crazy it kind of shows how so many of those stores are needless because Mm -hmm. you've got all these stores based off of foot traffic from this larger store Mm -hmm. so it's like they're hoping well you know we're at sears we might as well walk around this section of the mall and oh look there's a trinket store let's go buy a trinket yeah um yeah it really speaks to how those stores that closed really weren't essential yeah and and, well i I think that this is a perfect metaphor these malls are a metaphor for what's going on in america right now Mm -hmm. even pre-covid that sound is going to drive me crazy yeah i know they're drilling they're they're, they're, they're drilling next door i think we'll just try to talk through it anyway um the the before covid I think the, the malls were obviously dying even before COVID. This whole thing is going to accelerate it significantly. Yeah, yeah. I've got some Retail stats on that. General. We'll probably talk about those stats on, on the maximal just for the sake of time. But here's the thing. Uh, you look at these malls, you have these dying malls, and eventually a mall goes out of business. Yes. That's when it becomes a dead mall. Okay. So there's a dying mall is going out of business uh-huh. a dead mall is it, like, it doesn't have to be so you can revive there are rare cases where yeah. a dying mall has been revived right a, and um although it doesn't always it usually the outliers work. yes yeah and, so so a dying mall it, less than 50 percent occupancy a dead mall is like they shut their doors yes okay yeah uh or they they leave the doors open think of cincinnati mills or uh, fairfield uh fairfield what was it called forest fair mall yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and and it's, they had like one thing in there that. Yeah, yeah, you could still walk through, but it was there was still no there were no stores. Yeah. And so it was a very strange thing. At one point in the '90s, there was like a bunch of gang activity there. Really? Yeah. There oh, were like wow. people getting stabbed and stuff. And anyway, uh, so yeah, there was like turf wars. Well, I remember there was like a the club mall. there. It was like 18 plus, uh-huh. and they would put these big black X's on your hands if you were under 21. Uh-huh. And yeah, we would like go at 18 and then go in the bathroom and wash the X's off. <laughs> <laughs> you were like a prosthetic hand. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my hand, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, all right. Yeah, so, uh, and then a decaying mall, which are, I think, the most beautiful, actually, yeah. is, what, what, like, the Dayton Arcade, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, the, the, where mm. where they've they've gone many years, usually more than a decade, uh, of being empty, yeah. and they begin, be, they've begun to decay in, these sort of beautiful, in this beautiful way, where nature is almost reclaiming it in a way, mm-hmm. but here's the... the the beautiful part about that is sometimes these decaying malls can be repurposed once again. And so yeah. that's what we're going to be talking about today. You know, on Twitter, Samira said, uh, I used to be a mall walker at a large mall in Chicago, in the Chicago area. And I remember the elderly crowd waking at 7 a.m. before I had to go to work. I still walk in a different mall, but I can see it is slowly dying. Could you imagine being a mall walker and like every day, like you're having this time lapse? Of I like, know. yeah, that would be pretty interesting. F- filming that though, if you could have filmed that for a decade, yeah, wear a GoPro and yeah. walk, <laughs> walk around the mall yeah. for a decade. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that would have been amazing. Yeah. Uh, th- there's this modest mouse line, Ryan, from 1997. How uh, prescient was this? The malls are the soon-to-be ghost towns. Mm. 
And from 97. 97. This is wow. before the iPhone. This is before the MP3 and the iPod. Did you hear about... This is before the perifer- proliferation of the cell phone. Did you hear about the guy who invented them all? How much regret he had? Yeah, the from Gruen invent- effect. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I've got a whole article I want to read on the Maximal about Gruen. Okay. And, and why he started them all. But yeah. we, let's, let's give people a little a small history about it. Sure. So, so he, um, he worked for... The, the first mall was built by the Dayton Corporation, which is actually Target now. Mm. Um, but Target is, you know, it's a Minneapolis company. So the first, the first mall, first ever mall was in Minnesota. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, and happens the, to be where the Mall of America is too, right? Yes. We're, in fact, uh, I want to talk to you about the Mall of America. There's a new mall called the American Dream, which is hilarious. We're oh going to talk God. about that. I also want to talk to you about the largest mall in North America where we've given a talk, the yes. West Edmonton Mall. Yes. Uh, all of that we'll get to, I think, probably on the Maximal because okay. we have some questions. We, all right. So we the, need to answer. the history of the mall. The, so uh, in the 50s, he, he, he uh, Gruen did this. He, he was an architect and he decided that. We'll put a link to this, uh, the 99% Invisible art, uh, article that really goes through the whole history if you're interested. It's a great detailed article. It has a bunch of pictures, and there's even a podcast to go along with it. I would encourage you to check that out. But he he set this up as a community space because guess what? Minnesota is really cold mm. in the winter. Yeah. And so it was like, hey, what if we created a downtown but it was climate controlled and indoors. Yeah. And you could have your post office here, you could have your seamstress, you could have your tailor, you could have a restaurant, you could you, you could buy flowers, you, the you best could have a grocery intentions. store. Yeah. And best then, of intentions. Yes. And then it became the Kenwood Town Center. And then whatever. the corp- corporate greed took over. Yes. Yeah. And, and and when when that happened, it pushed out because mm. mall prices so I'll, I'll give you a few examples here. In in Dayton for for example, the more expensive square footage, like like at the green, when I was leasing stores oh back out in the b- back in the late oddies, mm-hmm. the green I think was fifty five dollars per square foot. Mm. Uh, uh, I think uh, Forest Fair Mall was sixty dollars a square foot. It was expensive. Wow. Uh, Kenwood one hundred and ten dollars a square oh, yeah. foot. Yeah. Uh, Kenwood is an interesting example of a mall that's like still thriving. <laughs> but town and country was twelve dollars a square foot. Oh wow. And, and so you you look at these different places uh, where and you go to a strip mall it's it, it, and you go to a strip mall in East Dayton and mm-hmm. it's five or eight dollars a square foot mm. and, and so it, there's this big disparity so what happened is of course your local tailor couldn't afford to maintain the hundred and ten dollar per square foot space in a mall and so all of the community spaces were sort of forced out because of the unfettered capitalism Mm. this is capitalism gone wrong you and i are uh, we we believe that capitalism works in so far as it's the worst system except for all the others right right (laughs) and and so we we acknowledge that socialism doesn't work and the capitalism doesn't work and we (laughs) probably what we probably need to do is leave both uh both ideas behind and if there's a way to tweeze out anything good if we can tweeze out community aspects from socialism mm-hmm. and if we can tweeze out the the market aspects of Cap- innovation yeah. I- I within capitalism then then great but if we can do that without greed without cronyism because mm-hmm. that's what capitalism has turned in, into today is crony, crony capitalism, capitalism. Yeah, yeah exactly absolutely. and so I, I got a lot I want to talk to you about yeah. with respect to malls, but you're right. There was really good intentions uh, where it started, and we'll talk about the history. We'll go go more into depth. We're going to go into square footage in all of the developed world. Why does America have so many malls? Yeah. Uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about. You know, there's something, before we move on to these voicemail questions, I heard a line over the weekend, uh, I forget what radio station I was listening to, but it was an interview with this man who said, uh, s- society start to decay when greed takes over, mm. and that couldn't be more true with malls. Yes, like when the greed takes over, like that's the beginning of the end. Well, think about greed for a second. Greed is it, it says you know greed is almost synonymous, or it's a level or two before solipsism. True solipsism as a mental disorder is I believe I'm literally the center of the universe, mm-hmm. and and when we say solipsism, we really just mean we are very self involved. We're narcissistic. Selfish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and there's a difference between selfish mm-hmm. and self-interested, right? Yeah. And, and you and I are for 
operating our own self-interest, sure. filling up our own tank, putting our own mask on before we assist others, right. so to speak. Mm-hmm. But if I just put my own mask on and then I, I start raiding other people's pockets on the plane because it's in my best interest, we're actually all just going to die. Right. And, and so... Um, in, in a meaningful way, we have to we have to be able to think beyond ourselves, and that's mm-hmm. why I think a lot of this this overindulgent consumerism, mm-hmm. we we see these malls dying because there is well there are a few things that happen. One is there is this overabundance of malls; they've been over mauled. Mm-hmm. And, and you look at a city like Cincinnati, and you mention the the whole history there, but literally dozens of of malls all over the the greater Cincinnati and Dayton area. Yeah. And and when I look at that, it's like, well, some of these were sustainable, but when we we literally put malls across the street from each other in this in examples of Kenwood and Tri County and, yeah. and and these different places and and don't worry if you're not from Cincinnati and you're listening to this this isn't a a Cincinnati centric podcast <laughs> um, but th- there are these examples but then also our behaviors are fluid they they change over time and we built these structures thinking they were going to be these permanent yeah. unmoving monuments to consumerism mm. and not realizing that, you know what? Consumer patterns change as technology changes, as preferences change. Yeah. And so I wanna to talk to you about some of those spaces today. Let's dive into these questions. We have a question from Corinne in Charleston, South Carolina. I would like to ask you to help me figure out how to get Amazon, specifically Whole Foods, to stop delivering my groceries in plastic. They are the leading delivery service of the nation and everything keeps coming in plastic. And I sent a message to my shopper. I said, please do not use plastic. Please only use paper. I am living as plastic free as possible. And they ignored it. So speaking of changing patterns, Ryan, yeah. this is one of the reasons that some of our malls are dying. And, and so uh, the reason I thought this, this voicemail stood out is we have a company like Amazon in particular. Now, it started before Amazon, obviously. Right. It's just like Netflix killed Blockbuster, right? right? But there were a bunch of other things that, that were hurting Blockbuster as well, the right. red box and all these Netflix other is kind of the final nail in the coffin, and Amazon mm-hmm. is kind of the final nail in the coffin for these uh, traditional retail stores. Yes. Yeah, yeah and for, for, for a lot of them at least, right? Yeah. And, and so what we're seeing here is a company who's able to sort of dictate their own practices. Mm-hmm. And how do you get Amazon to do something? <laughs> Yeah. Regulation. <laughs> so, what we're this podcast is about regulations, isn't it? Yeah, Corinne, I would encourage you to regulate them. <laughs> and and actually, so I know we're saying this in jest, mm-hmm. but you will have to regulate them. But regulating them on your individual level means you can't. If you if this is important to you, mm-hmm. if, if if shopping without plastic is important to you, then you're going to have to find a way around using it because apparently they're not willing to meet your demands. And, yeah, and if a business is not willing to provide the product or service that you want. Uh, You've got to find a substitute. Right. And the product or service you want involves a, a, a particular way that it's packaged, right? Yeah. Now, I will say, after we had Andrew McAfee on here, who's an MIT scientist, uh, I did a podcast with him. Yep. It, it was one of the few remote podcasts that we did. He's an MIT scientist. He's an environmentalist. He wrote the book More From Less. And he has a new essay in... Wired Magazine. We'll put a link to it in the show notes, but he is an environmentalist and he has assured me that plastic is not as big of a deal as we make it out to be. Mm. And I tend to trust science and scientists. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I would prefer to use fewer uh, bits of plastic whenever possible. Yeah. I think the message to get from it is I'm not going to be neurotic about the small things when there are much bigger things I can focus my time, attention, energy, effort on. Isn't some of the lead I'll have to listen to that podcast. Isn't some of the lead it's in an article. Oh. Uh isn't some of the lead in the ocean like due to like some of the plastic pollution not all of it but like are some of the yeah, like the the big also like the big plastic island that they have in the sea yeah yeah so um, let's talk about that yeah. just briefly so um and this is again coming from from andrew mcafee yeah and uh, he he says hey if you want your plastic to end up in the ocean there's only one thing you have to do mm-hmm. recycle it mm-hmm. which is terrifying to hear he's like yeah. it, it, he said you know personally i i will throw my plastic away because yeah. i know that we'll end up in a landfill and not in the ocean well what people understand or what what people don't understand with recycling is that 
they only recycle pristinely clean plastic. Mm -hmm. So if you've got like an Indian to-go container that's stained from Indian food and you mm -hmm. put that in the recycling bin, yes, that's going to end up not in a landfill. Right, and, and yeah. it could very possibly end up in the ocean. And yeah. the, the, the problem is, or, or and this, is what min, this is where minimalism works really well. I'm not about having a zero waste lifestyle, although I really applaud the people who, who live, they try to live a zero waste lifestyle. Yes. It's fundamentally impossible, but it, it's, uh, if you can get as close to zero as possible, right. then bravo to yeah. you. I think it's phenomenal. But what minimalism does it, is I consume less, mm -hmm. so I produce less waste. So even right. if I'm if I do bring some plastic into my life, I'm bringing far fewer things into my life. Thus, I'm creating less waste, whether it's recyclable waste or landfill waste or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct of consuming less. Yeah. So for Corinne here, I totally agree with what you're saying about she has to do the regulation herself. Mm -hmm. She's got one or two options. Options. She can continue to escalate this as far as she can to ha get them to stop using plastic bags. But ultimately, Amazon gets to decide whether or not they want to honor that request. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to not honor that request, then Corinne, if you want to live a plastic-free life or as little plastic as possible in your life, uh, you're, you might have to go to the store yourself and put those things in paper bags or reusable bags for that matter. Yeah, and, or find a company uh, to whom this is important. You know, we Ryan and I, we work with our friend Malcolm Fontier yeah. on this bag called Packed Bags. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, we have you know, the, this bag that showed up in our documentary. People kept asking, like, well, uh, where did you where did you get your bag? And like I'm like, there's only 300 that were ever made. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Ryan and I own 1% of the bags that were ever made. You're, right. you're not going to find one. Right. And but somehow people kept reaching out to Malcolm, and so we decided to, to partner up to to make this bag together. We did a Kickstarter for it. It's still available online. If you're interested, if you need a bag, you, here's the thing: you probably don't need a new bag. If you do, it's the best bag I've ever used. But um, in the whole process, we decided like, well, we don't want any plastic at all involved right. in, in the entire shipping process and the manufacturing. And so what we did was we made sure that we're not packaging this thing with plastic. We and that's really hard because you they put plastic on on everything. Isn't on it, the zippers, yeah. on the uh, around everything. the bag, the wrapping, the, the everything. Isn't it unfortunate that well, A, because it costs us a little bit more to do it this way. Significantly. So so it's unfortunate that uh, it costs more to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um but also you could tweet that podcast, Sean. Why, why? Why do companies have to be regulated to do the right thing, or why does Corinne mm -hmm. have to be regulated to do the right thing? This is the greed you're talking about. Yeah. But here's the other part: it's not just the company. We are also greedy. Exactly. We are asking companies. I want it for a dollar. I want free shipping. I want it in my door in mm -hmm. two hours. Yeah. That's my greed. When I'm when I'm saying I, I want I want this, I want it now, I want it cheaper. Mm -hmm. That's me being greedy. And all the company is doing is they are meeting my demand. If we were to go out and demand more from our companies, mm. then we could start to change things. Now, how do we do that? We do it with our wallets. We have to be willing to spend a little bit more, but if we're consuming less, considerably less, we're gonna split, spend slightly more on the things that are truly important to us, but we're still gonna be spending way less money overall. Wow, I've never thought of it that way. So we blame corporations for their evil, but they're just reacting to the demand. They absolutely are. Mm. And here's the thing, if we, if we stop demanding the cheap plastic junk, yeah. That they would stop doing it. This just goes back to I, the best way we can vote is with our dollar. Yes. yes that it is, is the best vote. Crane, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. I'll hold it up here for the YouTube audience if you're watching on YouTube. It's the first book that Ryan and I ever wrote way back in 2011, although we rewrote the whole thing in 2015. And uh, it really involves, well, it, it's the five what we call foundational values in our life. But it really shows you how we can focus on what we can control and what we can let go of. We can let go of the rest, basically. Yeah. So, so it shows you how to focus on the things that are within your control, improve those things, and then let go of the thing. It's sort of the, you know, it's a, a book form of the serenity prayer. <laughs> 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 control the things that you can and, and let go of, of the things that you can't. McKinsey in Tucson, Arizona has a question for us. What aspects of fashion align with minimalism's goal of intentionality? 
I've seen the two put at odds with each other more often than not, especially with the rise of environmentalism, but think that there must be some way to show clear intentionality through your personal style. So, Mackenzie, I think that when we're talking about fashion, again, this is a good question for this because I think a lot of our malls, especially in the 90s and the oddies and even, in, well, not even, but especially in the 20 teens, we need a name for that decade. I was thinking the teenies, maybe. <laughs> the I, always 20 call, teen, I like the teenies. I, I always call the, the, it's the 90s, the oddies, Odds, yeah. the, maybe the tennies. I don't know. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Right. Let us know on YouTube. Yeah, Write because in the yeah, comments. It, it works for everything. 2000, teenies works for everything. Yeah, 2013 to 2019. Uh -huh, but no, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Anyway. Yeah, so so somewhere in the 2010s, there, uh, fashion really became this fast fashion thing, right? Yeah. And... And there's no intentionality in fast fashion. Let's, right. let's just say that. Now, here, here's the problem I have. I'm a hypocrite mm. uh, because I, I wear clothes that I suspect, I, I, I'm, not, I'm probably not right now. I don't know. I, actually, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing. Um, I am, when you look at your average American, I'm, I'm more intentional than 98, maybe even 99% of the, the populace with respect to sure. my fashion. Mm -hmm. I try to get things that are made in America. Yeah. Uh, I try to get things that are even made locally. And I get things that will last me, so I'm willing to pay a little bit more. I also buy things without logos and it, with it, whenever possible. There are occasions where there might be a really tiny logo on something that I can't avoid. Mm -hmm. Or I'll even remove logos whenever I can. Yeah. These, these uh, shoes I'm wearing here, I'll hold it up for the camera. Um, man, these are really beat up, but these are, these are Tom. You know, that reminds me, we got this idea from David, didn't we? David who? Um, we stayed with him and his girl in San Diego. Oh yeah, yeah, Tooth Adams. Yeah, and he, yeah, Tooth Adams, that's right, on Twitter. And he, uh, he had a pair of Toms and he was removing, I remember him removing the Toms label when we were there. Like, I don't he remember just had, that, but yeah. I, I, anyway. the reason I did it, I had a, a Levi's, um, let's see what it's called a denim jacket right yeah. that i got off ebay mm -hmm. and here's the ebay hack for that you can get levi's denim jackets on ebay for like four to nine dollars nice but you have to buy like three or five of them in order to find one that fits you right oh. like, you just buy them one at a time until you get the right one that fits yeah and and but I often do, even now, I'll do this with, with different shirts and, and things, is you can buy new or next to new clothes uh, that someone bought and they just didn't enjoy it for whatever reason. They're yeah. selling on eBay. So even with my, my Levi's jackets, I would always just take the tag off because I don't, that company isn't paying me to advertise for them. I wouldn't do it anyway because advertisements suck. Mm -hmm. it, but so what am I going to do? Pay them for the privilege of advertising being a walking billboard on, on my body? Yeah. There's no way I'm going to do well, that. Well, th that's just the genius of marketing in this brand recognition thing, how people want to advertise the brand because that says something about how much you paid for something, where you stand you know, on the socioeconomic ladder, what kind of clique you're part of, what kind of style you have. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're relying on a brand to express who we are... Uh, we're just expressing that we we don't really think for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would encourage you to go back and check out two episodes we did. Uh, number the first one is episode fifty six, a long time ago. Ryan and I we were living in Montana. We did a clothing episode. It's one of our longer episodes. Yeah, uh, and it's just about clothing. Episode fifty six, and then more recently we did an episode called Fashion Obsession with Tyler Jones from Preachers and Sneakers. We talk about our sort of obsession with fashion. But to get to your question more directly, Mackenzie, I think the problem we've gotten into is we've built these bastions of consumerism that have required us to consume more in order to fuel their pockets, their their bank accounts, the, their corporations, their CEOs, their executives. And so what do they do? It used to be that we had two seasons, mm -hmm. warm and cold. Mm -hmm. And so in the winter we had a coat or maybe we had slightly thicker clothing or a sweater or whatever. But now you have places like H&M or other fast fashion places that do 52 seasons a year. Right. And they call them drops, right? And so, mm. and they do it in ways where it's like limited edition, trendy wow. clothes. Well, if something is trendy, to me, that's a red flag right away. Right. The trendy just means soon to go out of style. What does that mean? You have to replace it. Yeah. And if you have to replace something constantly, can you imagine, Ryan, if if you bought your your Toyota that you own, mm -hmm. and and I don't know, let's say that once a quarter you had to paint it. Yeah. 
because like there there's a new cool paint job that was in style. Yeah, I would buy a better quality car. Right, right. right. <laughs> but it, it, and it, here's the thing though, it doesn't doesn't mean the paint job was bad. Mm, we I get see. rid of the clothes now because it's like, well, that paint style, that yeah. that outer layer, the paint style, mm -hmm. is now no longer fashionable. It's no longer in vogue. Well, you know, it's interesting though. Uh, you know, I think that you can intersect fashion and minimalism. Uh, you can totally be fashionable. And still be a minimalist. Uh, I would encourage um, what's her name, Mackenzie, mm -hmm. to check out Project Three Two Three with Courtney Carver. Yeah. She hasn't checked that out, but yeah, we, in fact, we did an episode with her recently, uh, within the last year, yeah. about of, Project Three Thirty Three. She has a book of that same title. Yeah, some of the best dressed people at our events, some of the most fashionable people at our events, are doing Project Three Three Three. Almost always, and that, that's the thing because when we talk about intentionality, well, what is it? It's the deliberate use of the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the best places to go shopping is not at the mall. Right. They're dying anyway. <laughs> By the way, you, you don't want to go to a mall right now, regardless. Right. But, <laughs> but you want to go shopping in your own closet. Yeah. Because Start there. Yeah, the, you have things in your closet. I did this. Uh, I know this is weird timing. This is a total coincidence. But this weekend, I did it in my own closet. Mm. I have... I got rid of me, I who owns next to nothing. Mm -hmm. I have a whole trash bag right now. One shirt, one pair of pants, <laughs> and 67 jackets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing four jackets right now. <laughs> you have a trash bag full of uh, clothes to go donate? Yeah. Wow. Sadly, none of them were jackets. Oh. <laughs> I can't let go of my jackets. No, I, I, I get rid of jackets all the time. We're all um, hypocrites, man. Yeah, and here's the thing, though. Like, So I was talking about the hypocrite thing earlier is... I'm very intentional with my clothes, mm -hmm. but still, 93% of factory workers in the United States who work under OSHA conditions, mm -hmm. often in unions, often with a really good minimum wage and other fringe benefits, 93% of them say they work in sweatshop-like conditions. Wow. 93% of American factory workers. It's unbelievable. Uh, uh, garment factory workers. And, and so, yeah, it's it's staggering because even though I try really, really hard to be intentional, you can only be so intentional because the next step for me would be what? To make my own clothes, which yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do. Yeah, again, like those corporations, they're responding to the demand. Yes. Yeah, we need, to, we need to demand different things. Right, and so... Yeah. I would recommend finding things that are more timeless. When I say something that is timeless, it means for your lifetime. Will it, will it wasn't in style last year? Will it be in style next year? Maybe that's the, the, the good benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it could be basic colors. Ryan and I often wear just black. But yeah. if purple is your color, then great. Awesome. Accent this, your, your stuff with Dude, purple. Dude, if I look good in purple or blue, or I would buy different color t-shirts. But I just happen to, to like the way I look in black. You look great, Ryan. So that's what I wear every single day, what I feel best in. Yeah. I'm not going to switch up my shirt because... Because, you know, my sister tells me that I look like a goth. Mm. <laughs> She's tired of my style. <laughs> well, look at anyone that you that you find to be stylish from a decade or more past. So mm. for Ryan and me, that could be like Paul Newman or Steve McQueen or, or someone like that. Um, and, and for women, it could be, you know, Jackie O and uh, uh, whoever, Marilyn Monroe, whoever it might be. There are plenty of... Uh, oh, um... Who's the novelist that I absolutely love? Uh, uh, Joan Didion. Joan Didion is, you know, she was a, a style icon. Look at what she was wearing. That stuff would work today. Mm. The problem is the the hype of today would have never worked back then. But it doesn't say Supreme. <laughs> How do I know I'm Supreme if I don't wear Supreme? Mc McKenzie, I'm going to send you the Supreme book. <laughs> it's called Essential. Essays by the Minimalist. It's a collection of 150 different essays, 12 different areas of intentional living. And one essay in here has to do with clothing, about the favorite clothes of a minimalist. I think you'll enjoy that and the 149 other essays that are in that book. If you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of that or any of our books. Or we'll send you the book book or the ebook version if you'd like. Essential Essays by the Minimalist. Uh, Sean, if you'd send that out to her, I'd appreciate it. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. Text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of our phones, and we personally reply to as many as we can. So you can text us our questions, e your questions, even if... 
We don't answer them here on the air. We'll text you back in, in some form or fashion. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer every question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text of these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place thanks to our good friend Jessica Lynn Williams, minimalmaxims.com. All right, we got a question from Anka. Are there ways to transform vacant malls into something valuable for the community? Yes. And, and I think we should. Yeah. And so before I get into my pithy answer here, I want to talk about this because we have some spaces. Now, we're seeing this happen now, and this is a better use than just leaving it sit there decaying and rotting, although I think sometimes that's beautiful. I love looking at uh, Detroit at its at its sort of bottom, which was somewhere around, I don't know, 2010, oh God, dude, like 2009. The, yeah, the malls, the libraries. Yeah, there's some like yeah, really the schools, the libraries. beautiful things. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It, it, there, in fact, Sean, there's a photo essay. I don't remember if it was in Slate or New York Times, but it was somewhere. The photo essay of New York, or of Detroit, rather, from about a decade ago. And it's stunning. And there's yeah. something stunning about that decay. But we do want to reuse many of these spaces if we can. Now, yeah. A lot of these malls are being bought by Amazon and they're being turned into distribution centers. Now, there's a good reason for them to do it and it's actually yeah. better for the environment if they do it because the, a few things. One is they don't have to build a whole new space. Yeah. They, they get to reuse the space, which is, which is better than if they were to build something right next to it, right? right. But also, it's right next to the highway. So they don't have to drive 15, 20 minutes off of the highway, which uses more fuel, it produces more carbon yeah. di di dioxide, et cetera. And, and, and so it's better for the environment overall. However, I think there are so many other better uses. That's one use. And, it, and, and if that's going to work, then great. I know they're buying up a lot of malls and, wow. and, and, and turning them into distribution centers. Mm. I would love to see, um, it's my great hope that we could see a giant dent get put into the homeless crisis by reappropriating yeah. malls. It's a great idea. Into homeless centers with uh, services and yeah. uh, testing and, 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 and medical services and, and food and, and sleeping quarters as, as, a, as a transitionary space mm -hmm. to back to non-homeless life, right? Yeah. And, and because, I, I mean, I have so much compassion. Uh, when there's, there's such a problem here, especially in Southern California. I think about a, th uh, a fourth, I think it's a fourth of the homeless population in the country is in California. Yeah. In one state. It's crazy. And, and so th there's a large homeless problem here. And I think that we, we could address it by using some of these empty spaces that are not ever going to come back. Right. Uh, and that's the thing we have to recognize. This is fluid, as I talked about earlier. We built these things to think they would be permanent. And they could be permanent structures, but the, the use is not going to be permanent. Right. And so I think we can transform them. I also think that we are missing out a little bit on community space mm -hmm. because these were the, the one benefit of the malls. Uh, you remember when we were teens? We would go hang out at malls all the time. Yeah. I go to the Middletown Mall. Me and my brother went there like, Several all times time, a week. Yeah. Yeah. We used to go all the time. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time. And now if you look at the Middletown Mall, you got to see the video. I mean, it's, I it's terrifying, it out, yeah. man. Ryan, you, so Ryan managed a store in, in Middletown. Uh, it's in between Cincinnati and Dayton, Middletown. <laughs> um, and, and and so you, I think you have to you, you have to look and say, what is the best use of, of these spaces? Mm -hmm. Can they be transformed into experience spaces? Uh, I think in some cases, yes. Can they become more you know, town squares? Yes. Our friend Rob Bell, who's been on the podcast a couple times, we've been on his podcast, the Robcast. He's written ten books, but before he, uh, before he, well, before he moved to California, he was a mega church pastor. Mm -hmm. His church was in a mall, yeah. an old donated mall, mm -hmm. and so like it was an abandoned mall that they donated him in I think ninety eight maybe, mm -hmm. and and so. There are a lot of things we can do with these spaces that are shockingly more intentional than consumerism. Yeah, than the shopping mall itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so here's my pithy answer for you. Almost anything is more valuable than consumerism. Mm. And uh, uh, so I, I wrote this other thing down here. I don't know if it's a, a minimal, uh, minimal maxim or not. Abandoned malls are consumerism at its terminus. An empty carapace brimming with nostalgia not meaning mm. and i think there, there's something about that when ryan so in the dayton arcade yeah so you and i we're finishing up this new film with matt diavella mm -hmm. called less is now yeah 
and it Part of it surrounds, it's, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes of it now is around this talk that you and I went out and gave a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. We only use a few excerpts from that talk at this point, but we wanted to give that talk originally in an abandoned mall. Right. We just found that it was going to be really difficult, but we finally found one. We found the Dayton Arcade in in, in downtown Dayton uh, proper, and, and it's this beautiful abandoned structure has been abandoned i think since 89 beautiful decaying mall yes yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and uh, there's something just gorgeous about it in fact we uh, we had secured it we took two trips out there we did some filming inside it we were getting mm-hmm. ready to film the talk and then they found all this asbestos oh yeah and it was like oh like we can't have a whole crew of people here exposed to asbestos, asbestos for yeah. 12 or 14 hours a day yeah that's that you know 30 years from now they'll have mesothelioma it would not be a good thing yeah and so we had to let let that go even though it was gorgeous although it, i think parts of that will still make make it into the 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 film itself there were other malls that we wanted to use we we went and actually toured some other abandoned malls it just didn't work aesthetically it, right. because they weren't decaying yet so it just looked weird it looked yeah. like it, it looked like someone had closed the mall for us to film in it and yeah. it, it, it didn't work but we ended up finding a better space anyway so it worked out really well and I also wrote about the Dayton Arcade in our next book Love People Use Things and it got cut somewhere between the third and the fourth draft mm. that that section did so mm. I think I'm going to read it on the Maxwell episode because there's this whole metaphor about abandoned malls and how we've abandoned ourselves I'm really excited for the uh, renovation of the Dayton Arcade yes yeah, so let's talk about how they're going to use it because sure, I think that, that, that perfectly um, that perfectly addresses Anik, or, uh, Anka's, Anka's question yeah. here um, y- you've been there so, yeah. so talk about the space what it'll look like it looks post-apocalyptic. It's yeah. got like escalators that are decaying and these high gl- uh, ceilings that are glass uh, with, I guess, wire or copper like framing. And um, again, looks post-apocalyptic. Uh, cr- you know, old stores where you could tell it was like a sneaker store because you can just barely see half of a sign that you can make out the word sneaker. Yeah. Um, a lot of uh, old abandoned office spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is... it is. Uh, it's truly beautiful, but it's weird though because we keep calling these decaying malls beautiful. It's beautiful for the wrong reasons, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the thing about the Dayton Arcade, and we'll go into this more on the Maximal, is it wasn't originally a mall. Mm. It was a community space. Yeah, and it, this was, and it, it was actually built way before malls were ever even uh, invented. Oh, right. It was an indoor and outdoor community space. Mm. There were. It was a market. There were offices there. There were apartments. It was this shared living space. And eventually, uh, it, consumerism took over. Greed took over. Yes. Mm. And, and, but now here's the thing. It is being repurposed. It's being reclaimed. And, because the architecture is some of the most stunning architecture I've ever seen. Absolutely. Go ahead and Google Dayton Arcade, or we'll put a link to their website in, in the show notes. Yeah. But they, it is, it's amazing what they're doing, but they're turning it into a co-working space. They, there are going to be some shops in there, but it's not going to be retail-centric. It's going to be like a market. Community-centric, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, there's a technology lab that's going in there from the University of Dayton. Wow. Apartments, they, people, they're going to use it as a community space again. Yeah. And part of that does in- involve consuming, but it doesn't involve consumerism. Right. And I think we need to make that distinction. And so I think the Dayton Arcade is actually the best example of what we can do when we, we take a, a structure and we repurpose it in a way that is better for the community and, and doesn't encourage us to overindulge or to overconsume. Yeah. When, when I read this question, it made me think about you know, reusing things in general. And I think it's always better to reuse something if you can, uh, or repurpose it. Yeah. So, uh, my pithy answer is this reusing is better than recycling. Recycling is better than refuse. Refuse is better than refusing to let go. Mm. Yeah. So, Cause sometimes we get caught up in that. Well, it's going to go in a landfill and it's like, well, you should have thought about that before you bought it. Right. Uh, if, I would argue that the landfill is a better spot to put it than in your closet because in your closet, it's not going to decay as yeah. rapidly. Right. It's not going to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to decay with the rest of the trash. If you're holding onto it, then it's just taking up space and you're just keeping it around longer. 
Man, there's so much more I want to talk to you about. We got some listener tips today. We got a really great added value segment, Ryan. You are going to love this. It involves a a friend of the podcast. But we first we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. How much retail space does America have compared to the rest of the world? Mm. Man, it's a staggering, Ryan. I've got some stats for you. Okay. What other beacons of consumerism do you see disappear, disappearing or evolving in the coming years? Is shopping America's biggest religion? Mm. <laughs> if we turned a mall into a museum of consumerism, what exhibits would be in it? This is going to be a fun thought experiment. Also, uh, how can we replace shopping with meaningful experiences and what experiences? Plus, we got a million more questions about shopping, about dead and dying malls, and so much more for The Minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, check out our maximal episodes on The Minimalists Private Podcast. It's a completely separate podcast. It's just two bucks. And it's the most honest way for The Minimalists to earn income because we don't believe in advertisements. We think advertisements are gross. And so we make money only if you find value in and support what we create. Head on over to theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get a personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, my name is Daniel and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. In previous podcasts, I've heard people wanting to do more for the environment, but not knowing how they can contribute. I've been using the search engine called Ecosia. That's the letter E C. O-S-I-A dot org, Ecosia dot org. This search engine plants trees with its ad revenue. And while I do agree that advertisements suck, to me it's a small inconvenience to pay for a great contribution for searches I'd be doing anyway on the Internet. They have already planted over 17 million trees across the globe, and they post monthly video updates on YouTube. Hi, this is Lauren. I live in New Orleans. I was cleaning out my clothes closet and dresser this morning and wanted to share my tip for keeping a minimalist wardrobe. So in my dresser and my closet, I have stacks of items, underwear, socks, shirts, shorts, jeans, etc. All of my different clothing items are in stacks. When I do laundry, I put the clean items at the bottom of each stack, so the items that I haven't worn most recently end up at the top of the stack, and I try to choose items to wear from the top each day. That way, if I find myself not not willing to wear something that's on the top of the stack because I don't like it anymore or it doesn't fit anymore, then I know it's probably time to get rid of it. I also do this with my hanging clothes. I will put the laundered items on the right side and try to choose items to wear from the left side. So they're also constantly rotating. Consequently, I only had a small bag of items to get rid of during today's purge because I wear most of the items that I own. All right, y'all, for our added value this week, Ryan, our friend Matt Nathanson, mm-hmm. who had one of our fav- my favorite podcasts ever. Yeah. Uh, he's so, so good. good. I mean, it just so happens he's a phenomenal musician. He's also, when we saw him live, I think it was that night after we did a podcast with yeah, him, yeah. and um, he, he has such a great live show. He's like a stand-up comic. Well... I generally hate live albums. I think they're not as good as I'm studio the same albums. Way. Yeah. This is an exception. He just put out a live album. Awesome. It's called Live in Paradise, Boston. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And here's the thing. The album has 61 songs on it. And That's I think incredible. about half of them were recorded in Boston. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, mostly acoustic uh, songs. But there's so much life in these songs, mm. and he—you get to see his like stand-up comedy prowess in between the uh, songs. So he does these little sketches, but he—he he then put another thirty or so songs on there from other live events throughout that entire tour. So it could be he was in Fairfax, or he was in Columbus, or wherever he was, and he was doing these shows, and he would take songs from here or there. And there's so much energy and life in these. Like, I feel like I could just, I could sit around the house all day and just enjoy this entire album. But I think he made it so robust because he wanted you to make sort of your own playlist out of it. Because if you have 61 songs, 
Make it your own. What, what would be the perfect 10 song yeah. album for you? If all 61 of your favorite songs, then none of them are your favorite songs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so check it out. Matt Nathanson. It makes me think of uh, when he opened up for us in Boston. Remember that debacle with that's when we started to be like, oh crap, we can't do these like little meetups anymore. Yeah, yeah, we we, we had we just had so many. Uh, I yeah, mean, it was like that whole tour though, 2014. Yeah, was a lot of surprises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good surprises for sure. But yeah, anyway, I, Matt Nathanson. It is called Live in Paradise, Boston. Let us know what you think about it. Comment on YouTube. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the album. And real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Actually, two things. So let's talk about community spaces. And, and I know that we're in the middle of this pandemic, but there's going to be a time when we come out of it. And I think even now, we're, what we're finding is we need, we need support from other people. And so Ryan and I, back when we were in 2014, speaking of that tour, mm. we went to 100 different cities. And in each city, we left behind a free local meetup group. And these are people who aren't necessarily minimalist. Some of them are, some of them are, but they talk about decluttering. They talk about careers. They talk about health and life and everything in between relationships. And it's called minimalist.org. That is yeah. the website. And you can go there. You can find your city. There's a hundred different cities, eight different countries, but there's also right now there's an, uh, this is especially valuable. There's an online city as well. Yeah. So even if you don't have uh, a city near you. But if you do, let's say you live in Saskatoon and we left behind a, a meetup group in Saskatoon mm -hmm. and you want to meet with those people. They're, they're just, it's just a group. You meet online until you're able to meet in person again. Yeah. And you can interact with people locally even if you're not next to them. And eventually when things open back up, you can start meeting with open-minded people locally. I say that specifically. Not like-minded people. They might have different beliefs from you. And yeah. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I aren't like-minded. But we're both open-minded. We're open to each other's beliefs. Yeah. So check that out, minimalist.org. Also, I thought I'd give you an update. Uh, this past weekend, we just closed. We, we did 48 hours, a, a record for my writing class. Nice. I'm really shocked by. Awesome. But So if you didn't get into the writing class, too bad for you. I'm sorry. It's not opening back up anytime soon. Yeah. Um, this isn't one of those things where it's like, oh, I'm going to extend it for three more days. Act now. Nope. Sorry. Uh, you are, you're, you're out of luck right now. Yeah. Uh, but congratulations if you did make it in. I'm looking forward to, to well, by the time this comes out in a couple weeks or next week, whenever it comes out, um, we'll already be inter interacting at that point. But really looking forward to the class. Uh, some, some great questions coming in so far from the students. But if you're interested in a future class, uh, I'll notify you whenever you, whenever we decide to open it up again. I usually only do it a couple times a year. But you, in the meantime, if you do want to learn how to write better, I've got a free ebook called 11 Ways to Write Better. And if you download that, I'll also inform you via email whenever the class opens back up. Of course, we'll never ever send you spam or junk or advertisements or anything like that. But if you want the 11 Ways to Write Better ebook, it's howtowritebetter.org. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at the minimalists.com you'll also receive our simple sunday emails but never spam never junk nothing disgusting and if you leave here today with just one message we hope it's this love people and use things because the opposite never works thanks for listening y'all we'll see you next time every little thing you think that you need every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it